Let's start it. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. We're thrilled to have such a great turnout for this um, exciting kickoff uh, today. I'm Roger Mark D'Souza, the Director of the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center, and we're delighted to be working with our partners at USAID and Agility and, and others to launch the Advancing Climate Resilient Development Symposium that promises to be very interesting and enlightening. It's good to have many colleagues in town to share their experiences and, and to learn um, about where we can go forth and, and go next with this work. I think many of you are familiar with the Woodrow Wilson Center. We established uh, by Congress as a living memorial to President Wilson, the only president to have a PhD, and we really function in the spirit of President Wilson to bring together the worlds of academia, analysis, uh, policy, and programs, and linking all of that to, to public service. And uh, some of you may be familiar familiar with some recent rankings um, from University of Pennsylvania looking at think tanks. And the Wilson Center was ranked as the number five U.S. think tank, number 10 worldwide, and the top U.S. think tank to look out for. So that's, that's very exciting for us. One of the rankings that we also received was the number two best transdisciplinary research program in the United States. And we're particularly proud of that because a lot of the work that we do in our transdisciplinary work focuses on climate and climate resilient development. A lot of our work in that arena is supported by USAID. We have a program that works with the Office of Global Health, our Health Environment Livelihoods Population and Security program that looks at the links between climate change, development, resilience, and population dynamics with a focus on reproductive health and women empowerment and we also have a new um, and continuing collaboration with USAID's Office of Conflict uh, Management and Mitigation, our Resilience for Peace project that's looking at the connections between resiliency, conflict, climate change and peace building. So we're very um, thrilled to have this long-standing support with, with USAID. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussions today and for the rest of the week and I'd like to start by um, introducing John Furlow who will get us uh, kicked off. John, as many of you know, mm -hmm. is a senior climate change specialist at USAID, currently on detail at the State Department and a long-term um, collaborator and partner in these efforts. So, John? Thank you, Roger Mark, and thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting us here. This is a great venue. <clears throat> if the folks that are standing in the back want to come on in and sit, this would be a great time because we're kind of between, we're just getting started, so come on in. Um, I want to introduce, I know your agendas say that Kit Batten will be giving the keynote. Unfortunately, Kit couldn't make it. I think that uh, Kit is mired in something that she'd rather not be and <laughs> would probably rather be here, but we are very lucky that, um, that Rolf Anderson, our office director, uh, the director of the Climate Change Office at USAID, could stand in, ably, I'm sure. Um, so Rolf has been with our office for a, about a year and a half now, in from the Philippines uh, most recently, and uh, once everyone sits, I'll turn it over to Rolf. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone. Is anyone from State Department here? No, not yet? Good. Well, then I can fess <laughs> up. <laughs> State has stolen John from us. They said they borrowed him. I don't know when they're going to give him back, but we, we want him back. <laughs> He's an uh, extremely valuable player. Uh, we have a very strong team in the Climate Change Office, and John is a good example of that. And, uh, and this project is a good example of one of the m many strong projects that we have in our office. Um, anyway, I do want to say hello to you all and uh, good morning. We're very excited to have you here for this week's uh, Advancing Climate Resilient Development Symposium uh, hosted by our office. Um, you know, we're, we're really pleased. I see there's NGOs, contractors, universities, the USG community here today. And that's part of our growing adaptation community, both here in Washington and around the country. That's uh, 
that's helping us to uh, decode climate resilient development and figure out what we can and need to be doing. Um, the United States, of course, as a general rule, is, is very involved in the climate space. Uh, we're integrating climate change considerations into all of our development actions, and I have to say that the President has taken some significant steps in the last year to really advance uh, uh, the integration of climate into all of our work overseas. Among the things that we're really doing, though, just a, at a very high level, is we're fostering low carbon growth. We're promoting sustainable and resilient societies. And of course, we're trying to reduce emissions from deforestation and land degradation. Um, USAID's working with our partner countries to help them manage their climate-related risks while meeting their development goals. For, uh, for instance, USAID is developing and improving methods and approaches for integrating climate risk into our development activities. Now, over the last five years, uh, I've seen a real shift around the world. And, and I did, as, as uh, John mentioned, had the opportunity to work in the Philippines. And at that time, I was also managing 12 countries in the Pacific. And over the last two years, I've traveled uh, to Latin America, to Africa, and other places as well. So I've had an opportunity to see what different governments and societies are doing to to manage these risks and to adapt. Uh, you know, over the history of humans, we're actually quite good at adaptation. Um, even agriculture is an adaptive response to securing food supplies. More recently, you know, we've done, you want to modify your climate so that it's uh, more comfortable, you, you use air, con air conditioning. Uh, and there's many instances throughout the history of mankind where we've moved in the, in the, in the, in the, in the presence of, of difficult challenges. But we're finding now, as I've visited these countries and these governments, that uh, they're actually having quite a bit of difficulty of understanding, coming to terms, and learning how to deal with the climate risks. And, you know, if you're at a local government versus a national government, it's, it's, it's a daunting challenge. And I think that the issue in a lot of ways is about uncertainty. You know, they don't know what the level of impact is going to be. They don't know what the cost is going to be. It's very difficult to make decisions in those types of circumstances. I mean, decision makers need, need some level of, of, uh, of understanding in order to make an informed decision. So I really think that a lot of what you're doing and what we're doing is about helping to have informed decision making so people can make the right choices and right decisions and the right responses. And I think that this project has played a major role for us to starting to learn uh, about this new adaptation challenge that we have, which is climate change. Um, specifically, most recently, uh, this, the Climate Change and Resilient Development Project has uh, helped develop the Climate Resilient Development Framework, which is a comprehensive approach for integrating climate change into development planning and practice. Uh, the framework has great potential, in our view, for broader uh, adoption across USAID and by other development partners. And really, it's about you know, it's not about climate first, it's about development first. And understanding the development challenges and objectives of countries and then helping to, them to, to fit in the adaptation response into that context. Um, the program has also provided direct support to several of our uh, GCC integration pilots. Over the last couple of years, USAID's funded 10 integration pilots around the world, and what the, uh, we had an incentive fund, and we gave a small amount of resources to each country to, so that they could look at their uh, regular development projects and uh, have an integrated um, uh, component about uh, climate resilience. Some examples of those were in Kazakhstan, the Dominican Republic, and Macedonia, and the project did indeed help them to ensure that the missions had strong access to strong technical expertise when integrating climate change components into their development work. And I have to say, you know, it's been a major challenge. If, if you're out in the missions, you're, you're dealing with a lot of people who aren't climate experts. I mean, they're a water expert, or they're a health person, or they're a, uh, uh, doing economic policy. And uh, they don't really know what to make of the uh, climate challenge. What's their role? What should they be doing? And so we have a lot of work to do uh, in working with the USAID missions as well as of our, our, our country partners for them to understand how they uh, integrate climate into their work. The program has also advanced the agency's work on climate services. Uh, providing a model for the new public-private partnership on climate data information 
And you'll be hearing more about this later this week. Um, back in the fall, the President announced a new PPP for climate data, and we're working very closely with other government agencies uh, to uh, m find ways to downscale information to countries so that to solve particular development problems. And we're in the process of identifying which regions that, that will be, it is, as well as what uh, what uh, specific uh, climate problems, um, and you'll be hearing a lot more about this in, in the future. It's also a great opportunity. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is integrate our existing programs as well as bring on new partners. Um, USAID is very committed to the whole idea that we should be, you know, being as inclusive as possible and inviting new partners to the table to participate and bring in their ideas and their capacities as well. And I think the, the, the PPP is a great uh, example of that. Um, finally, the program has also helped uh, USA to respond to a, a series of presidential executive orders which have been directing all federal agencies to incorporate climate resilience into their activities. Um, I don't remember the number of this one, 13653 or something, and it was issued by President Obama in the fall. And we are scrambling to try to figure out how to, to look at the risks that all of our normal, everyday projects have uh, from climate impacts, and then to have an appropriate response to it. And so we've been actually meeting with uh, uh, development partners around the world, whether it's World Bank, GIZ, and others, as well as meeting with other USG agencies and there's a mixed bag out there. There's a lot of great response that's going on, even domestically. Uh, and, but kind of learning what's the sweet spot in terms of what do we do of having a simple methodology to identify climate risk in projects such as you've got a, a judicial project, a health project, you've got a forestry project, will it be affected by climate or not? Once again, you're, t you're talking about working with uh, folks in the field. And you'll be hearing a lot more about this because really every single project in USA needs to take these into consideration, the impacts into consideration, and then make a determination whether to uh, adjust the project or not. And we're, we're, we're cognizant of the fact that, that our programs face not just climate risk, but multiple risks. It could be from, from uh, conflict, for example, um, corruption, or, or other types of risks. And then take measures to mitigate and monitor those impacts. And so it's, it's been a high bar set by the, the, the executive office. and. Um, and I'm actually very proud to say that uh, Kit and the team here at USAID is helping lead the federal effort, along with Treasury, in terms of in integrating this climate resilience throughout our, our development por portfolio. Anyway, uh, this week at the symposium, you'll have an opportunity to learn about and discuss the Climate Resilient Development Framework and its applications, the Adaptation Partnership, lessons learned from the CCRD program, particularly about high mountain and urban areas, uh, uh, connecting research with decision making, and new directions in adaptation. Um, so I think that there's a lot of richness to be uh, gained this week. Of course, there's a, a variety of locations throughout the city and they're in your agenda. Um, uh, at our closing session, I'm supposed to make a plug for this, uh, on Thursday we'll be discussing some of USAID's new directions in, in climate resilient development, including a presentation on our new uh, climate knowledge portal that we'll be unveiling. It's called climatelinks.org, and you'll all learn about how you can log in. That's going to be a great opportunity. I think it's kind of a soft rollout. We, we really want uh, our, our partners to be involved in the beta version of this. and. Uh, help it to develop it into a knowledge portal that you and us can use to, to learn and share information. And there's a real gap out there of, at least internally, of how do we share information amongst ourselves so that we uh, get better at what we do. Anyway, uh, we look forward to collaborating with all of you both this week and in the future as we advance the field of climate resilient development. And thank you very much for being with us here today.
Thank you very much, Rob, for, for kicking us off. So I think uh, some uh, some good good framing for us as we get into these discussions over the next few days. Some um, reminders about thinking of sustainable and resilient societies, dealing with risks, climate risks, uncertainty, what it means for informed decision making. We're looking forward to hearing more about these um, integration pilots and then uh, continuing the discussion on climate services and, and climate data, particularly, um, as, as you reminded us, the importance of being able to downscale information. Um, good to hear the reminder on partnerships and the importance of, of mainstreaming and looking at measures to, to mitigate and, and, and monitor. Um, and then looking forward to learning more about the soft launch for climate links and how we could um, participate in that and be part of that process. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to John, who's going to provide some, um, some perspectives for us in terms of uh, things to be thinking about for the next few days. John? Thank you, and thank you, Rolf, <clears throat> for standing in. That was great. Um, I want to do several things here. First of all, I know that you all saw the agenda because you had to register for it. And that was like some kind of an intelligence test. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we could take half of that and put it on the SAT and use it to <laughs> screen out people for the math test. But we had to do it because the, um, the response was great. Thank you for being here. Um, and so a couple of housekeeping things. We're not going to clear the rooms, but as you well know, you registered by session. So if you registered for a session but not the next session, Please go so somebody else can have your, your seat. <laughs> um, and we're going to try to make the turnover quick because we have, despite saying that we wouldn't, we have packed the agenda for the week. Um, and we're already, I think, a few minutes behind. Um, you're going to hear a lot about climate links. Um, we are, as, as Rolf and Roger Mark both said, we're finally standing up uh, a, a climate, an information portal to house a lot of the information that we've uh, been developing over the years, not just for adaptation, but across the climate initiative. Um, it's called Climate Links. When you registered downstairs this morning with that tiny, tiny printed sheet, <laughs> um, the first column, I think, said, do you want to receive information about Climate Links? I think you have the opportunity to check that box every day that you sign in. You can also uh, speak to Amy Daniels. You want to raise your hand, Amy? She's the mastermind behind Climate Links. Um, so I think the idea of the soft launch is we want to start testing, but we don't want to advertise it broadly. Um, but I think about five or 600 people have registered for the different pieces of this week. So uh, that's, I guess, a manageable number. So if you're interested, please sign up. Um, Next, we have a number of our, uh, our partners for the CCRD project from around the world here this week to speak at different sessions. So I'm just going to introduce them, and if you could all stand up briefly when I do so. First, we have Glenroy Brown from the Jamaica Meteorological Service. Um, Glenroy has been, has 20 years experience with weather forecasting, and he's the lead on the agrometeorological program. So providing useful information to farmers so they can plan their, uh, their activities. Um, Glenroy is speaking on Thursday morning, which is the Climate Services Day. Um, Lu Duc Quang from Vietnam. Here we go. Um, he's the Deputy Director General of the Vietnam Institute for Urban and Rural Planning in the Ministry of Construction. Um, Vietnam has been a partner on our Urban Infrastructure Services program called CRIS. We're going to hear more about CRIS on Wednesday. Wednesday. Thank you. Um, and uh, in Vietnam, working with Cascadia Consulting Group, we tested a, a tool called um, the Climate Impacts Decision Support Tool. Uh, I can't remember the acronym. SIMPAC. SIMDST. SIMDST. SIMPAC DST. SIMPAC DST. SIMPAC DST. SIMPAC DST. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Next, uh, Maria Sofia Dunin Borkowski from Peru uh, is a partner on our um, Pura urban program, um, planning program. 
Thank you for being here. Um, she is with the, she's a forest engineer and independent consultant and has been our in-country lead on the, the CRIS program in Pura. Again, Wednesday is Urban Day. Alex Guerra Noriega from Guatemala is the director of the Private Institute for the Investigation of Climate Change. I will not try the Spanish name for that. Um, uh, we've been partnering with them on one of the adaptation partnership workshops several years ago, and then they also received a grant to continue some work um, exchanging lessons among farmers and uh, bringing weather and climate information into agricultural activities. Um, we have several people from Macedonia. Um, Igor Slavkovsky is the executive director, director of Milia Contact in Macedonia. Um, Alex Karayev uh, is the capacity building coordinator with Milia Contact. And Vlatko Ognanovsky, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> uh, Vladko is the uh, the chief of project, chief, chief of party for the the project that we have there. Um, and finally, Cesar Porto Carrero. There he is. Um, Cesar has been an integral part of our mountain work. Uh, he's been a joy to work with. Um, Cesar is one of the world's leaders in engineering, uh, managing the risk of uh, glacier lake outburst floods. We've learned, I've learned a tremendous amount from him. And he is also a finalist for this year's Edmund Hillary Mountain Legacy Medal. We're, we're rooting for you. Um, and all of the people that I named will be speaking at some point during the week. Um, the urban people are Wednesday. Glenroy and the Climate Services Day is Thursday. Mountains is tomorrow evening um, at the Cosmos Club. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Lawrence Bouja, who is the rapporteur for the, the whole symposium. Um, Lawrence will be rapporteuring for the week, and then he's going to give us a little report out on Thursday after lunch. Uh, Lawrence is the, or Dr. Bouja, is the director of the Climate Service and Applications Program at NCAR in Boulder. Thank you for being here. Lawrence also co-led with Glenn uh, the book we did on, um, or we supported, on valuing climate services, um, which I think will come up on. That was Jeff Lazar. That wasn't you? I thought you had a hand in that. OK. <laughs> he was the moral supporter of the, the effort. And it needed some moral support. <laughs> um, anyway, apologies for that. Um, Thank you, everyone. As you know, the agenda is complicated. I think you all have a copy. I will click through it um, very quickly. We're partway through this. Um, Pablo Suarez, Pablo? There he is, has told me that we're going to have a, an interactive lunch. I expect it will be highly interactive. Um, and Pablo told me before we got started that this was even sort of out there for him. So I have no idea what we're going to be doing, but I'm sure it will be memorable and a lot of fun and very educational. So um, that should be a lot of fun. And then we'll continue with today. And then in the afternoon, we have a reception or in the evening. Um, tomorrow morning is at the State Department. And that one, I apologize if you couldn't register. Uh, we wanted to have it at the State Department because it's focused on a program that they funded for us. And there are restrictions on how many people without a US government badge can come in. So we had to keep that one small. But most of the things we discussed there will be covered in more detail elsewhere. And then tomorrow evening at the Cosmos Club, um, we have lessons from the High Mountain Adaptation Partnership. Um, Urban Day is Wednesday. We're at the Carnegie Endowment. Again, remember, we are moving around a lot. Um, so check your agenda and make sure you go to the right place. Um, Yes, Urban Day is Wednesday. Thursday is climate services in the morning. And then after lunch is the wrap up and the uh, kind of a round table or an, an audience participation on new directions for the program. And with that, I will turn it back over to Roger Mark. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting us. Thanks.
Thank you very much, John. So, um, memorable, fun, and educational. Those are three operational words for the next few days, not just, not just for lunch. Um, as, as you look at your agenda, I'd like to draw your attention to just page 14. Um, they're the biographies of, of all the speakers. Um, so if you need to look at that um, any further, please, please have a look at that. We're going to move in to our session this morning, the CCRD overview, and Glenn Anderson, who's the Chief of Party at Angility, and Peter Schwartz, the CCRD Deputy Chief of Party at ICF International, will kick us off with this session. Um, they will speak for about half an hour, and then we will have about half an hour for a question and answer. Then we go to coffee break and then reconvene. So I'm going to hand it over to, to Glenn and Peter now. You don't want to stand with me, do you? Well, I, uh, I'll, <coughs> you'll yeah. hang, I'll throw stuff. Okay. You throw stuff at him. Oh, sure. <laughs> Am I doing the slides? Yeah, that's the you advice. can, right here, if uh, you'd like. I, oh. hate, I hate it when I have to do something technical. Would you, would you like to leave it here? This in cell phones just completely confound me, but I'll, I'll try it. Uh, well, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, as I said, I thought John Furlow was going to talk a little bit about why CCRD, but I guess, I guess um, he's not. So I'll, I'll try to fill in a little bit on that. And uh, this presentation I'm going to share with Peter Schultz, who's the Deputy Chief of Party. Uh, from ICF International, and um, I'm going to just give you a, a pretty much an overview. A lot of a lot of the topics that we'll cover in our presentation will be covered in more detail in later sessions this week. Um, here's my first. Ha. Okay. So I got through my first hurdle. Um, CCRD is what we call our project: Climate Resilient Development Framework, um, or Climate Resilient development project. And when we started this project with all of our partners, we had a competition to try to name the project and come up with an acronym. And I offered a bottle of wine to whoever came up with the best acronym. And we got some pretty really ridiculous um, <laughs> um, examples. And then the winning one was proposed by me. So I got to drink my own wine. Ah. <laughs> so these things happen. You know, I didn't plan it that way, but right. <laughs> it did work out that way. Um, CCRD is, has been a really unique opportunity for us, and I want to thank USAID for having the confidence. I don't know if they'd go back how they feel four years later, but in giving this project to us and our team. And it was unique in the sense that um, there wasn't a most field projects have a very detailed scope of work, five, six tasks with subtasks and all of that, and you know what you're going to do for the next four or five years. Well, this was a project that was very much demand driven. And so we had the opportunity as we went to add additional activities. And, and, and this allowed us to fill gaps and go into some new areas, and it's been very exciting. The other thing that was unique about this project is we didn't work with just one USAID staffer. We worked with five. Um, and John Furlow, uh, Ken Baum, and Nora Firm, who are no longer with the agency, Jonathan Cook, and Jenny Frankel Reed there. And this has been really exciting because there was an opportunity for a lot of cross fertilization and working with that group. Also, and Andre Mershon, who's in the back, I think I saw somewhere. Um, plus, we got a chance to work with some other people. Uh, in other offices, including Eric Hyman, who's here, I believe. Um, so it was very unique, because we normally just work with one uh, a core, a contracting officer's representative. In this case, we got to work with quite a few people. So the project was working with the Global Climate Change Office in E3. It's implemented by in IRG Agility. We were IRG when we started. We're in Agility when we finish. <laughs> um, Four-year project, and it ends in August 2015. And the team is rather large. Um, and our original partners were uh, ICF, Stratus, and the Manoff Group, and then Cascadia, represented by uh, 
in, in the middle row here, <laughs> um, joined us later when the work that they started in Vietnam really took off and there were real opportunities to, to roll it out and replicate the tool they were using in Vietnam uh, in up to 60 cities, I believe. Um, we also worked with a number of universities and NGOs and some, are, some of those are represented today. Um, the original group in the proposal was uh, IRI at Columbia um, and then we, and the Environmental Law Institute, and we added University of Texas, South Carolina, um, and the Mountain Institute as full partners uh, later on. The, um, the project was set up with three objectives. Um, it, was, it was designed to be a support project uh, to work with USAID missions and bureaus. And this involved working on guidance and case studies and, and providing technical assistance. And a lot of this was demand driven, and I'll give you a few examples shortly. Uh, we also had an objective uh, to coordinate with other government agencies to support mainstreaming of climate change uh, into development. And the major piece of that uh, was mentioned earlier, and I assume no one is here from State Department yet, but uh, State Department provided a very uh, a buy-in to the project when we started that allowed us to um, help uh, assist in implementing a series of seven workshops and follow-on activity. Uh, and then the third objective was pretty wide open at the beginning of the project and this was to sort of identify emerging issues and gaps in adaptation knowledge, science, and research and working with aid to scope out some activities in those areas. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the climate resilient uh, development framework, which is this, because John, after the break, John Furlow will give you a, a more of a history of it, how we got there, where we started, and how we got there. Um, but just to mention that this framework really was the centerpiece of the entire project. Uh, we tried to test it, to um, build on it, to um, add um, nuances through annexes um, and we did all of our capacity building uh, and did it consistent with this framework which we consider to be a very flexible approach for considering climate information and development planning and John will talk about um, after the break about how that happened so we produced a number of, we, we helped aid put together this framework and then we our team developed a number of annexes and Jason Vogel in the afternoon after lunch we'll talk about those and then one of them we we supported um, was actually prepared by DACHA, USA DACHA on conflict and climate change. <clears throat> um, just to, to illustrate some of the things we've done working with bureaus and missions, uh, one major piece that that we helped out with was the the Federal Agency Climate Change Adaptation Plan and this was a, a required of all USAID missions to develop a climate change adaptation plan and and the project helped um, USAID develop their um, strategy for this. Um, this whole activity was managed by CEQ I believe. And then we've also been helping out a bit in implementing the executive order that uh, Rolf mentioned earlier. Um, we were asked to do a case study in the Philippines and this was a background document for an RFP that was issued by the mission out there subsequently. And we supported a couple of, of the integration pilots, uh, Kazakhstan, which is implemented by UNDP and I'll talk about that at the end of today, some work we did in the agricultural sector there. Uh, Macedonia, our three, Macedo three Macedonian um, representatives have worked with CCRD um, to integrate um, elements of the climate resilient development framework into a pre-existing planning process called the green agenda and so we've been working with them uh, there's several people in the room Charlotte Mack, Mukul Sharma and I have been working with them for the last year and a half uh, to develop it and they'll talk about that on Wednesday um, we did a couple of desktop studies for different missions and we've been involved in doing some capacity development work um, 
we supported Eric Hyman's workshops on economics of adaptation and talked about looking at economics of, uh, of infrastructure and of climate services. And we've supported for the last three years, I believe, two or three years, the infrastructure workshops, the annual infrastructure workshops in December. So this is all sort of under objective one. Um, another part of objective one is our communications program. And we, there's a table out there with a number of hard copies of our documents. Um, by the end of the project, I think that I can't remember the exact number, they will have produced over 100 technical reports on this project. Technical reports, um, two pagers, um, and a lot of uh, training materials as well. And all of that information is freely available, publicly available. Um, earlier mentioned the Adaptation Partnership. This was a, um, was a partnership that was established by the United States, Costa Rica, and Spain. And it was designed to provide a forum for the exchange of ideas to talk about emerging issues outside of the more formal negotiations that go on uh, at the COP every year. And uh, US uh, State Department provided money for CCRD to help support a series of workshops. And these workshops are listed here. Uh, seven of them and a couple I just want to highlight a couple of these uh, the Nepal workshop um, was really provided the catalyst for our high mountain adaptation program that you'll that you'll hear if you're at the session on Tuesday afternoon the meeting in New York uh, was the first international conference on climate services ICCS and um, the Climate Services Partnership formed as a result of that meeting, and the project has supported them, and quite a bit of work in the climate services arena. And that will be on, uh, discussed on Thursday. Um, Costa Rica, Alex is from Costa Rica. As a result of that workshop, we did a competitive small grant program and uh, awarded three Central American uh, grants. And Thailand, um, was building urban climate resilience in Asia, and that was sort of the uh, sort of the catalyst for our program, which we would call climate resilient infrastructure services that Peter will talk about in a couple of minutes. So this entire adaptation partnership, which is no longer active, was an incredible catalyst for objective three. It helped us to identify some really important research areas and gaps that we were able to with the, the blessing of USAID and the participation to develop uh, very large programs in, in all of these areas. Um, one of these programs I mentioned, I'll just, just give you just a little quick snapshot of the High Mountains Adaptation Partnership. This, uh, this program, um, officially was launched with the uh, 2011 uh, workshop and research uh, trek in, in Nepal that John Furlow was involved in and I did part of. Um, but the high map really had started back in 2009 in Peru with a, a what was called a south-south exchange um, to look at uh, glacial lake outburst flooding problems in mountains, particularly lakes that were, because of retreat of glaciers, were getting very large very quickly. And um, as a result of that, we developed a program with the Mountain Institute, University of Texas, and have done several things that are listed here, um, local adaptation um, planning in Nepal and in Peru, which led to LAPAS. Um, we did some new innovative work in assessing glacial lake outburst floods using ground penetrating radar and uh, bathmetric surveys. Um, did a number of surveys and issued 11 climber scientist grants. And Cesar um, authored a, um, a glacial lake engineering um, handbook which features 20 different lake case studies and 
the assessments that were done and the solutions that came uh, out of those. Um, so, um, so this program is, uh, we've completed this program now and hopefully uh, there'll be some follow up to it. Um, my last slide on climate services program, um, as a result of that meeting in New York, the Climate Services Partnership was formed and the project has supported the Secretariat, which has managed three uh, additional climate service, international conferences on climate service, uh, the most recent in, in December in Uruguay. Um, we've, we've also developed a new climate service product working with Glenroy Brown in Jamaica. And the picture there is of essentially the first uh, ever drought forecast that was developed um, between working uh, with uh, Met Service and this working group in Jamaica and, I and, um, and IRI. Um, we've also did a series of technical assessments on the quality of climate services. And Ed Carr over here led the very expensive version, uh, which was in Mali. <laughs> and then after, after we had run out of budget, we, um, we did some more modest assessments, which were called mid-level assessments. And then um, I personally got involved in, uh, we, we've just finished a book on the economic value of climate services, which will be published. It's a joint effort between USA, the Climate Services Partnership, the World Bank, and the World Meteorological Organization. And it will be published and launched at the World uh, Meteorological Congress in May in uh, Geneva. And um, we've also done some training in the, in the use of climate services. And um, I just finished a training a couple weeks ago in the Caribbean where we trained 14 uh, representatives of MET services in 14 countries on how to design a socioeconomic benefit study um, to help them justify the expenditures that were being made on MET services. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on Thursday. Okay, Peter. So this is part two of our, our uh, tag team. Uh, let's see, so I'll figure out how to do this. Okay. Um, Another of uh, the cornerstones of, of our work within CCRD has been our support for the Nat National Adaptation Planning Process, the NAPs, uh, which are follow-ons to the NAPAs. And we had uh, a number of engagements, high-level technical uh, workshops that we uh, supported um, in places like Jamaica and uh, Tanzania, uh, a regional workshop in West Africa. We did some work in Cambodia uh, in partnership with GIZ. And uh, this work focused on thinking through the climate resilient development framework. Uh, and some of these engagements uh, took place before the ink had really dried on what the nature of the CRD framework would be. Um, so th there was a, a strong focus on the first three steps in that process, on the scope step, and you'll hear more about this from, from John in a second, on the scope uh, process, on the assess process, and on the design. Uh, the, the final two steps are on the implementation and then the evaluation, kind of learning by doing um, and, and iteratively improving um, the process going forward. Um, so, for example, in Jamaica, um, we began with the um, Vision 2030 document that the government of Jamaica had produced that outlined the government's uh, national development goals. So we didn't come in saying this is what you should be trying to achieve. We began with what they had set out for themselves trying to achieve from a broad context and then thought systematically about how climate overleaves on the, uh, the sectors that are crucial for achieving those development uh, objectives and thinking through what one needs to do to ensure a climate resilient future toward those development goals. Um, so coming out of this, there have been a number of uh, pieces of guidance including technical guidance to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as a forthcoming uh, uh, academic submission, uh, peer-reviewed paper on lessons learned from the, the NAP process. Let's see. Next thing I'll talk about 
is the Climate Resilient Infrastructure Services Program, uh, which was led by my colleague Joanne Potter. Um, this was a, a program that uh, was focused on uh, helping to improve our understanding of climate resilient development and uh, as a test bed for the climate resilient development process uh, in five medium-sized, rapidly growing cities. And the, the goal here was to uh, develop, test, and share innovative methods for ensuring reliable, sustainable infrastructure services in a changing climate. And, and the focus here is on service. It's a holistic view of uh, the, the services that are provided by infrastructure, not just the impacts on the infrastructure and what might one what one might do to protect or to harden those things. It's really how do you ensure that those services continue to move forward. So we had these five cities that are shown on this map here. Uh, in Santo Domingo, uh, the focus was on the overhaul that's being undertaken there um, in one of the districts there uh, related to the, the sanitation system and thinking through the, the adaptation options that, that might be uh, put in place there to ensure uh, resilience of the services. In Pure Peru, one of the foci uh, was on working together with the infrastructure um, uh, planning and investment process um, and ensuring the climate resilience in that. In Trujillo, Peru, um, we looked at short-term and long-term or medium-term adaptation options and thought through what the kind of the portfolio of, of uh, options makes sense for Trujillo in dealing with the climate threats that they have. And um, they're kind of interestingly uh, thinking through a process that we've developed under CCRD, which we call fast track implementation, which is to really accelerate those things that can be accelerated, that are readily implementable. Um, to demonstrate some early wins, some early successes, and, and to build support for the things that take take more time to assess and to, to design and to implement and, and evaluate. Um, in Nicola Porto, uh, we were looking at the, the very serious threats that erosion um, induced by climate variability um, is, is uh, causing there and uh, how to think through the financing and, and doing some very practical things in terms of um, uh, having a, a right shop to help build capacity to bring in the financing in Nicola Porto to uh, help ensure the resilience associated things uh, with things, infrastructure services that are potentially affected by climate related erosion among others. And in Hue, Vietnam, there uh, again, uh, coming back to the, the tool um, that, that John mentioned, um, th this is an innovative tool that uh, we help to build capacity in, in Vietnam and, and it's now being used throughout Vietnam to think through in intelligent ways about making climate smart decisions related to land use, among other things. So some of the highlights of CRIS were the, the tools um, that have emerged from it. Um, so there were some tools that we went in and were testing from the outset, and there were other tools that emerged uh, and that were developed in this process. One set of tools um, were, were tools uh, designed to screen for climate variability or uh, climate, I'm sorry, vulnerability. Um, it's sort of a rapid process of figuring out where to prioritize subsequent action, uh, where, where to prioritize more detailed assessments of, of climate vulnerability. Another class of tools that were developed um, are very practical ways for identifying options to ad uh, address the vulnerabilities um, that were identified through the screening and subsequent vulnerability assessments. Um, another thing that was developed uh, were these decision-driven climate summaries and an interactive climate information database to support climate-informed decision-making. Another hallmark, and, and maybe the most important hallmark of the CRISP process was who owns this process? Um, it was designed from the outset, and, and in particular because of the, the very careful scoping that was done at the outset of the process to be owned by the local partners. This is, in the five cities where we're working, we have a fair amount of confidence that when we pull out, when CCRD pulls out, that the good work will continue because the capacity has been built um, the, the knowledge is there, the motivation is there, there's an understanding among the local partners why this is important. So the products that have come out through this process I think are really, uh, you know, in, in all due deference to aid, they're owned by those, 
by the people there on the ground. And they really sort of um, have taken it on themselves to carry these things forward. Uh, and some of the ways in which um, uh, some of the things that are owned um, are listed on this slide, including these working groups um, that are going to be uh, moving forward, these locally owned action plans. Um, there's a, a process of peer learning, uh, which is pretty robust and has played out in a number of, of places. And my final slide is intended to kind of wrap up this presentation by Glenn and myself um, on an overview of, of the project. Um, to give you a sense of some of the illustrative questions that Glenn and I have in mind that we'd like you to think about um, moving forward in this process. So we've lumped them into two categories. One is how can the climate resilient development framework be mainstream both inside and outside of the agency? So what opportunities exist to do that? All the way from the high level planning within the agency and, the, and perhaps even the budgeting process, all the way down through the activity and the project level. Um, and how, what, are the, what are the ways in which that can be done? And that, this is important because this is not a box checking exercise. This is not, you know, if you've gone through it once, you're, you're climate safe. This is a process that really needs to be mainstreamed into the fabric of development. Um, so what opportunities exist to do that? What are the barriers that need to be overcome? In, a, in, a, in an agency um, that works through um, three and five year projects, how can there be the continuity to do that, that, that learning, um, to monitor and evaluate and to improve um, at going forward? Um, how can that be, be sort of thought about um, in intelligent ways? Um, what partnerships both within the agency and outside of the agency need to be developed? One of the fun things about working on this, this project is the opportunity to work across the agency, to work with the Health Bureau, to work with the folks who are focused on infrastructure um, and, and other areas uh, in security um, and a whole host of other areas with, within the agency to think about um, how to main, mainstream this. So there are partnerships inside of the agency that we need to think about going forward and outside of the agency as, as well. Capacity building. Everybody that's worked in a developing country has seen this firsthand, that, that there is a need for capacity of all types. Um, so those are some of the obvious things, those of you in development, I need not repeat those, but there's also the capacity that needs to be developed uh, among funders and across funders to develop a shared understanding of how to move forward with these kinds of things. The second main area that Glenn and I call out are uh, related to the technical developments that are needed. Um, anytime you do a project like this, you answer some questions and, you, and, and then there are at least as many new questions that appear. Um, there are questions um, that we've been grappling with about the sufficiency of data. When we're working in these extremely data sparse areas, how can we come to terms with that? Well, one opportunity that we've seen in this is to take advantage of unconventional data sources, data sources that were maybe not or originated for the purposes of climate activities, um, like, for example, the demographic and health surveys that aid has been undertaking for the last couple of decades. We see opportunity to use that to understand climate vulnerabilities and to design adaptation action. So what are innovative approaches uh, that we can take to, to provide the information necessary for climate smart decision making? What kind of analyses and what kind of tools do we need, practical tools? The second area that we see, and, this, and these are just illustrative, this is not purported to be comprehensive. I'm sure you'll have other uh, major categories that you think are important for us to, to discuss, and we should. Second area, though, that I'd like to call out is the importance of better understanding the ep economics. What are the costs of inaction? What are the costs of action? And, and I personally contend, this isn't a um, sort of a, a project-wide view, but I personally contend that we're not going to be able to make major transformational progress until we have a better understanding of what the economics are. We will tend toward win-win solutions, but we will tend to not make um, investments in infrastructure, for example, that are expensive, whose main purpose it is to protect against the threats of climate change. But when we can demonstrate the business case, then we'll be able to make some of the transformational adaptations that I think many of us think are very important uh, down the road. So we see an important area in economics. And then the third area is this really thorny issue of monitoring and evaluation and how to, how to monitor not just the, the uh, outputs um, from a program like CCRD, 
uh, but it's the outcomes and the long-term impacts when we might not be expecting to see the full-blown force of climate change come into effect for a couple of decades. How do we think intelligently through that process? We see some opportunity to learn from lessons from disasters. Maybe that's one area. But there's a community of practice um, that, that is emerging in this area, and, and CCRD has helped to support that, and we're proud of that. Um, so maybe with that, I'll stop, um, and Glenn and I can take uh, questions about this. But thank you for coming. We look forward to the week of discussions. Thank you very much, Peter. I, I was hoping you were going to answer some of those questions, <laughs> <laughs> not pose them. <laughs> so indeed, not, not a box checking exercise. And, and in that spirit, we want to open up the floor um, for questions. This is being recorded. So as my colleagues come to you with a microphone, I'll ask you to give your name and affiliation and to get to your question as quickly as possible or comment so that we can get a range of questions. So yes, in the back here, please. Uh, hi, Spencer Schecht with American University. Um, the making the business case, and we're not going to make transformation until the economics are, are better understood. Um, it can be argued that the simple economics are it's going to be expensive to deal with climate change today and extremely expensive to deal with climate change in 10, 20 years and then exponentially increasing. Um, is that not a good case right now to deal with it? Okay, thank you. Let's take a couple more questions. Anyone else for now? All right. Yes, please. Um, so my colleague's going to come to you with a microphone. And your name and affiliation. I'm Ian Fitzsimmons with Still Point Solutions. In an early slide, um, the mention was made of uh, the adaptation partnership, and I know there's a piece of there's a publication out there on the desk. Um, but it was mentioned that it's now defunct. And uh, given all the, um, the expense that's been put into the thought part of this process, thinking it through, uh, which, is, which is difficult, but gives good returns to investment down the road, uh, uh, one, one wants to know what happened to the partnership <laughs> and why it's not there anymore. Okay, thank you. So the business case and the adaptation partnership. Why don't you take the second question? Okay. So, <clears throat> thanks, Ian. The, we didn't stop thinking when the partnership ended, I hope. Um, the idea behind the partnership was it, it grew out of the negotiations in Copenhagen. And after a lot of progress was made there, and then there was sort of this sudden stop when we couldn't get every country on board in a consensus process. A number of countries started saying, well, there's a lot actually going on in the world that's not being fully acknowledged in the political process. So what if we went outside that process um, and took it away from the, the politics and just focused on practitioners? And so I think three partnerships formed, one focused on forestry, one on um, energy and mitigation, and then the adaptation partnership was proposed by Costa Rica. They went to Spain and said, we, I think we should do this. There's a lot to learn from one another. And Spain and Costa Rica uh, uh, approached the U.S. Um, and then and they approached the State Department. State came to us. And we talked among the, the three countries about what would be useful in advancing adaptation kind of in parallel or separate from the negotiations. And so it was, uh, I think it was a perfect thing for aid to take on. But because the, the signals were there, in Copenhagen and coming after Copenhagen that there would be probably an adaptation committee, that there would be a role um, for the least developed countries expert group of the UNFCCC. Um, there was a bit of nervousness among, about why would there be this outside uh, partnership? Shouldn't that be something that the, the UNFCCC itself is working on? So the three countries said, well, we'll, we'll make this temporary. Once the adaptation committee is set up and up and running, the partnership will go away, but we don't want to wait one or two or more years for all of that to get agreed. Um, and so we agreed that it would run for two years. So it ran from, uh, I guess, we launched it summer of 2010 
Um, and then it wrapped up in Durban, which I think was, no, in Doha, 2012. Um, so it was finite. The High Map, the High Mountain Partnership, the Climate Services Partnership, um, the work we've been doing focused on uh, agriculture, and then the Climate Resilient Infrastructure Services Program all grew out of that, and they're still uh, at different levels of activity. We hope they will continue after C CRD runs out in September. Um, but the commitment we made to make it palatable to the, to the countries involved in the UNFCCC was this is a temporary measure and it will stop. And so it, it did. I think I'll take on the first question. Um, I think in many respects you can certainly make the business case in the short term um, because climate variability concerns extreme events and disasters and, and you can certainly make an argument that uh, the investments that we're making uh, are important to improve general resilience of the population and particularly um, groups which we refer to as marginal populations. Um, the, the bigger challenge, and I'll just state two and then if Peter may have more ideas. Um, one issue for longer term investments such as in infrastructure is that we've got to deal with rate of time preference. Um, although I'd like to use a zero discount rate on everything, um, when you're building infrastructure for 50 to 100 years, most of the benefits are going to be very far in the future and you're, you're, you're looking at costs that are, have to be incurred very soon. And, you know, this is one of the, you know, they call economics a dismal science for a reason. I mean, it's, uh, you, if you put in a positive discount rate, benefits far in the future are discounted back to the present when you've got to make decisions on your investments. So that's one issue. But I think the other issue in making the business case, and this is the one that we're all still concerned about with the framework, is... Adaptation can't be really viewed, you can't silo adaptation. You've got to look at it in the context of all the other investments that you're making in development. And that means that we don't yet have the tools to be able to compare an option which somebody would say, yeah, that's an adaptation option, with just doing things like building up better livelihoods, increasing people's income so that they can cope better with disasters and things. And we don't have the metrics yet that we're going to need. So the economic questions get very complicated. And I think that I think we're aware of them. And I think there's a lot of people that are, are looking at these questions very carefully. But I don't believe we're there yet. I don't believe we can compare uh, improving governance with building infrastructure, with doing adaptation options, with doing agricultural products. We don't have the metrics yet to do that sort of thing. Just to add on to that, and I'm glad that that question was asked because I think it's such an important question to ask. And I think at a broad level, um, we see a, a it's a slam dunk in, in some areas. Um, but that's us kind of looking in from afar. Um, when it comes down to the actual um, financial decision making, do I do this, do I do that, or do, do I do the other? In many, and I'd, I'd argue in most cases, um, particularly in the private sector, um, there isn't the information there. There isn't, we don't have the data yet in hand that say that by taking this measure or maybe this other measure in combination with that first measure um, will A, it'll have a certain cost because some of these actions are things that we, we haven't really explored, many of them we have, uh, but probably more importantly, B, we don't understand what the, the economic payoff from them will be. We don't understand what their effectiveness will be in a, in a highly varying climate. Um, in the United States, we have much more information about this, but I think that there are many economists who are working on this issue in the United States that say that, the, that just simply the information, even let alone the kind of framework that, that Glenn was talking about, um, the, the just the, the simple information in a, in a, a um, highly sort of understood place like the United States is really poor. And then you try to translate that to a developing country. And it's the situation is, is not what we want it to be. There are many exceptions. I mean, we see sort of the Coca-Colas of the world going out and thinking about this and, and sort of demonstrating that they're doing it. But those are more the exceptions than they are the rule. 
and we'd like to, to see it become more of the rule. Thank you. R Ralph, I was um, intrigued that you had mentioned earlier that you were managing 12 countries in the Pacific, and you know, you, you mentioned that at the level of the missions, it's, it, this is not always easy. A lot of the mission staff are trying to figure this out themselves. I wonder whether you could share any of your thoughts and perspectives. We have a lot of great tools and wonderful publications coming out of this project. Um, what are some of your thoughts of, in terms of the best ways to mainstream this work at the mission level? Mm -hmm. How can we best help the mission staff who are, uh, are struggling with how to climate proof their work and integrate some of this into their, their priorities and responsibilities? Any thoughts? Sure, that's a great question and actually we're grappling with that right now. Um, and. Um, so at USAID right now, we're, we're taking another look at the whole program and project cycle, uh, as opposed to just kind of a, let's send out a, a raft of information. And as you know, people are kind of overloaded, actually, with both uh, uh, information tasks from Washington, demands. We really put a lot on to the, the mission. Every time something comes up, we say, okay, well, let's just get the mission to do it. So we're taking a step back right now and looking at the process, and we're saying we're going to start from the design process. So uh, right now our PPL and our team is taking a look at that whole process, looking at everything from the country strategy level through the pad to the, pr to the project level to try to identify the uh, decision points where we could be most effective. We haven't actually made a decision about that yet. I think we're leaning right now uh, towards uh, taking the initial actions at the uh, CDCS level, that's the country strategy level, where you take a more holistic, very broad look at what areas of the um, development interventions will be affected. Uh, and then, uh, so the, f the first screen will be, oh, maybe we should be working in, in a particular area of development that we hadn't considered before. Or if we're working in a particular area like agriculture, we should be looking at the climate impacts of different agriculture areas and then and taking a, a broad view that we should maybe make uh, investments in certain places rather than others. Uh, down the line, I think we're going to be looking at a much more sort of particular um, project level look and, and look at what the uh, potential impacts on specific projects will be. That's a heavy, heavy lift for the missions at this time. And uh, our, our, our thinking right now is, is that we won't be looking retrospectively. It'll just be for new projects that come online. Mm -hmm. that you should look at a new project, identify um, what the potential impacts are, and then what measures you might take and what the cost would be. because. In some cases, the cost could be so significant, particularly for things like infrastructure, that you might say, oh, we're only going to be do, you know, half a bridge or half as many sort of uh, small projects as, <laughs> as we would otherwise. <laughs> a actually, what we're generally trying to do, and the, the, the position that we're sort of taking is, is that through smart design, you can make better choices that, you know, you might uh, place those projects, whether it'll be uh, schools or uh, new infrastructure, and locate them appropriately and through those designs uh, have a very low incremental cost to the project. So the next thing is is that uh, we're going to be taking steps uh, to uh, provide that expertise to the, to the missions and uh, likely we'll develop uh, some tools and, and mechanisms to provide that support to missions because they really don't know how to take that action themselves at this point. So I think it's going to be a very rich area looking forward for the agency. And, uh, and then uh, also through things like the new knowledge portal, we'll be able to share information right. to, to make it easily available. So I think that with the new social media, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for us to, to transfer uh, what knowledge we have. Thank you. John? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, early on and actually before CCRD pro uh, started, a colleague who's now in Peru told me that guidebooks and stuff like that are not the thing that the folks in the mission want. They have tons of stuff to read. They'd really like us to come show them how to do things. And at that time, we had a staff of about eight people, and so we couldn't visit all of the missions. We have since built up our training team. I think we've trained about 600 people over the last two or three years. Um, we've moved some of the trainings into the field offices so that um, we can get there with them so they can work on things that they actually have to deliver on. So in addition to doing all the things Rolf is looking at, our training team is trying to take that and turn it from a big, thick book that people might not want to read into a training module 
uh, that's interactive that gets them actually practicing it. And the feedback so far has been pretty positive. We've seen some neat programs coming out, and I hope that we'll be able to continue that. And Andre, who I think is no longer sitting in the back of the room, <laughs> was a part of the training team when that when we really started ramping up, and I think he's done a great job, and so has the, the subsequent uh, training team. Great. Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning. This is Meredith Muth from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency. John, I was, you just mentioned training, training teams. Could you add a little bit of specificity in terms of what types of training? Great. Thank you. Let me see if I got any, any, any other questions. I'm going to add a question to that um, uh, for you, Glenn. So, Glenn, when, when you started talking, you specifically mentioned that this project was demand-driven, and you talked about having to work with five USAD staffers and cross-fertilization, and, and you pre presented that in a very positive way. I, I want to peel the onion a little bit. What was difficult? about that what what <laughs> problems did this create and now looking back if you had to do anything differently what would you do differently what have you learned what what were the the, the complications that emerged as a result and how can we learn from that moving forward okay, so i'm going to give you a minute to think about that uh, while and john all the so. us aid people leave the room for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> so john training getting me to go to state for a while. <laughs> that was part of the plan. <laughs> um, so on training, the training that I was mostly referring to is uh, our training team within the office provides uh, training to our field staff. I think we do one per year here in Washington and then several others around the world um, on the rules that we have to follow. Um, on the overall, you know, there's an overview of the climate and development strategy that came out in 2012, I think. Uh, there's one on the, the definitions and on monitoring and evaluation, and then there are more um, sort of sectoral trainings on the adaptation framework with case studies and so forth. There's the same thing for the sustainable landscapes pillar of the program. So our, the overall aid program focuses on clean energy and mitigation, on sustainable landscapes, which is uh, roughly speaking our version of Red Plus, and then on adaptation. And so the, the trainings hit on all of those. Um, M&E, there's sessions on the resources that we have available. Um, and we're moving more into thinking about writing a scope of work or writing a uh, country, country development uh, cooperation strategy, um, and some of the other things in the program cycle that aid has to follow. So it's really aimed, most of the training is aimed at field staff, enabling them to do the work that we hope they will do. We've also begun bringing, um, implementing partners in, in some cases, so they understand the way that we, that we're thinking about these challenges. Yeah, I'll compliment that. Um, there's a bit of a contradiction going on right now, and, and that's that, uh, 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 to answer your question, on one hand, when you're looking at the missions and you're going out to support them, you have to keep it as, in some ways as simple as possible, really, uh, to make it really actionable and easy for non-climate people to, uh, to incorporate activities uh, into their particular sector. So they are not climate scientists, and they're really looking for something that is uh, u usable for them. On the other hand, in terms of the training program, we have uh, provided this uh, uh, Climate 101 for a number of years, and now the missions are starting to ask for a much more complicated, in-depth kind of trainings to really uh, take it to the next level. So they, they, they want more context. They don't want it to be just the basics or just about the climate science, but uh, how do I incorporate this in a, in a meaningful way? And then real quick, maybe to something that would be more of interest to Meredith, we also supported uh, trainings for Met Services. Glenroy has been involved in some of those, um, particularly in the Caribbean, taking lessons that we developed, well, that Jamaica developed and sharing them across the region. We've done trainings. Um, uh, Cesar was involved in, in training of people working, dealing with glacier lake hazards. So on some of the technical topics that we've seen, we've also done trainings not so much for aid staff as for in-country 
uh, experts <laughs> dealing with these challenges. So there's sort of two levels of, to the training. And if, if, if I may, I can just add, so we at the Wilson Center um, also have funding from uh, the Bureau of Global Health to do some of this work, and we have um, coordinated with John. We just came back from Jamaica, whereby we were conducting training for the focal points from the various ministries who are charged with rolling out Jamaica's climate change strategy. So working with USAID, we provided training on climate vulnerability assessments, how to climate-proof policies, projects, and plans, and how to integrate gender and demographic analysis into um, the national strategies that were being rolled out. So the mission staff were there with us um, doing these trainings with the ministerial focal points. So that's another example of a, a buy-in that we have in a collaboration with, with this, this program. So, Okay. Well, this is probably my last project, so I guess I can say whatever I want. <laughs> um, I think that, th as you probably figure out, this is a huge project, and we had a very, very large team. In fact, our team was so deep that we were able to literally put different groups of people on almost every single activity that we were doing. And we could have probably worked with the five people and USAID, if they had no other projects to deal with, that we would have been fine. Because we literally, I think, to be quite frank, and there's a lot of our team in the room, um, we could have used five full-time USAID people to support this project. Unfortunately, everybody had other responsibilities. So, and, and we felt, we really felt bad at times because we'd be beating up on John or Jonathan, you know, oh, Jonathan, how's the review of that annex coming? You know, and it's <laughs> like, you know, I, I got this trip here, you know, I've got these other things to work on. So for us, the, the problem was more that the GCC office is a very busy office, and they're running a lot of different activities, plus they have the usual sort of management support that they have to do that they can't ask contractors to do. So it was more just time management, you know, for the USAID people. There, there was nothing negative. I think, I don't think any of us felt that we ever got bad advice. I think everything that we worked on together, and I think, you know, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time, and. The thing I really enjoyed is that we felt more like partners. You know, we really worked with aid. We could go and talk to them about what do you want to do, and it was a very much a give and take sort of thing. So the only real negative was just time management mm -hmm. in the project. It's interesting because we recently featured a project here, five-year climate adaptation project that USAID is supporting with WWF and CARE in Nepal. And one of the main distinguishing features of that project was the flexibility in working with USAID staff. And they said that, that was, it's, it's very uncommon and that was really what made, made the difference. Peter, I'm not going to let you off the hook that, that easily. You, um, you, you, you posed these questions at the end, and I was, those were some of the questions I had for you. You know me, and I am, of course, very happy that you mentioned thinking of demographic and health surveys and sort of integrating that work. But I really do want to hear some of your thoughts about those opportunities to better um, integrate both within USAID and outside of USAID. You know, those of us who work on climate resiliency, for example, knows that, know that USAID has a partnership with Rockefeller Foundation. Is, is this an opportunity? What are some of the opportunities you see having worked on this project? As opposed to posing the question for us, I'm going to ask you. And we have just a couple minutes. Yeah, I, I see a, a lot of opportunity. Um, so in, internally within the agency, I see an opportunity um, but this requires a transformation. Uh, I see an opportunity to learn from one project and bring that into the next project. Um, so CCRD will be winding down. There are other projects that are starting up. Um, how can we effectively convey the lessons that have been learned through this process and the momentum that has been developed in this process and carry that on um, to other projects? And you know, I recognize that there's a change in implementing partners, and that's, that's a challenge. But the, the staff here 
are, are here. They're permanent staff. And, and, and I think that there is more that can be done to um, keep these things going, to keep the momentum going. Um, so that's sort of an internal um, looking dimension to this. But I, I think that there are also opportunities to build on the kinds of things that we did within CCRD, um, picking up on this idea of training. So um, there, was, uh, th there were a couple of things that we were doing related to training of trainers. Um, so again, allowing this project to pull out and that momentum to continue and that, con that, that momentum, that capacity um, is, it, is built into the fabric of the, the people on the ground and not just our implementing partners, but the people, uh, the stakeholders that we're trying to work with. Um, so that's one thing, um, you know, and, and my colleague Charlotte Mack has been instrumental in that, and there are other people in the room that have been, been working on this sort of training of trainers concept. There's this other concept of uh, peer learning, um, and we've really tried to, to, to facilitate peer learning to the maximum extent possible because there's the sense, and I think there's, a back, there's um, sort of literature in, in, in psychology that um, backs this up, that if we learn from trusted um, voices that we're more likely to accept what mm -hmm. it is that they're saying as opposed to hearing something from a voice that we don't recognize, mm -hmm. we don't know what their agenda is, yeah. and going in, we trust them. I mm -hmm. trust you, Roger Mark. Oh, so if you tell man. me something, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to believe it. But someone off the street, yeah. maybe not so much. So. And so there's this peer learning process that has been has played out, for example, in the Latin American Caribbean. There's a workshop that we did where they were, they were teaching each other. Yeah. And there's an excitement that happens. There's a, a depth that happens that you can't happen when the gringo comes yeah. in and, and sure. tries to do it. That third party validation from a trusted source. Glenn, final comments? Yeah, I, I want to say something about the outside the agency uh, piece. Um, I was teasing my good friend Ed Carr about the study he did in Mali. Um, it was very expensive, but it's arguably the best study that's ever been done. And But what happened as a result of that study is that we challenged Ed and other people working in climate services to come up with a methodology where you wouldn't have to spend as much money to do a reasonable assessment of a climate service. And we got down to working with forty, fifty thousand dollars to do a to go a study. And I think that one of the challenges we're gonna face outside the agency is that as long as you've got project funds, you can afford to do good vulnerability assessments, you can do good climate service assessments, you can do good economic studies. And what we have to recognize is that we don't either have the time nor the resources and often not the data or the capacity to do what I would consider the Mercedes version of anything we want to do. And I think the real challenge, and aid you know, has benefited because the U.S. has a very strong domestic uh, capabilities in these areas. And I think the real challenge in the out, outside the agency is can we provide products, can we provide tools that are flexible and adaptable to the situations that exist in the countries where people want to use them. And I think that's really, I think that's for all of us that w work in development, that's always our challenge. Great, thank you. Well, let's leave it there for now. We are going to take a 15 minute coffee break and then we'll uh, come back into this room to continue. So um, thank you. Thank you.